or to study your word. Um, Father, we thank you that um, the current situation hasn't changed anything in the work of your kingdom. We pray as we study, continue in the book of James today, that the Holy Spirit will teach us any difficult areas that the Holy Spirit will simplify it in Jesus name. Amen. So what I want us to do, if we have our Bibles, we can um, read um, the book of James chapter five. Just read them um, please from verse one to 12 and then we see I try and treat that and then we go to the second part next week. Right, so um, I'm reading from the New King James Version, James chapter 5, from verse 1. It says, Rich oppressors will be judged in the title. So I wanted to read out that title as well. So it says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Verse four, indeed the wages of the laborer who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud cry out and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the, the just. He does not resist you. Verse seven. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and later rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patient. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You, you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus name. Amen. So, right, so the whole thing we've read here, you, you can see there's something that is standing out. That, that, that thing that is standing out is how the rich oppresses the poor. That was what, what was standing out actually. And then towards the letter um, section of what we've, what we've read, we are then encouraged to persevere. So that is what the bulk of what we're going to look at this evening, the issue uh, about the rich and the poor. But I will start by asking you a question. And that question is, do you have an oppressor heart? Is your heart the heart that will seem to oppress others? And that is a question all of us have to answer at our individual times uh, in, in this our Christian journey. But the general idea, again here, James tells the rich in his congregation as well as the rich Jewish oppressors who might be listening. He told them to listen up, okay? Okay, so what does that, that mean? It means that they should pay attention to his words. And, and the, the point he's trying to make is that um, if, they, if they don't listen, there is trouble ahead, which we have learned that there will be judgment. So that is really what he's trying to tell them. Um, and the, the, the issue in question was, you know, about material possession. Um, it's warning them that if we live just to acquire material possessions, we will end up with nothing of real intrinsic 
importance really. So if we base our the way we live our life on material possession, our life will be empty, lonely and bitter because uh, that which we are chasing gives us nothing in return. If we chase only material, we are missing the, the mark. Yeah, there is something more sinister that we need to be chasing rather than material. Um, so realistically, if we do that, we get nothing in return. But when we chase uh, wealth, we end up robbing ourselves of the bigger riches that God has to give us. So James tells his people here not to be fooled by listening to some people who usually say that um, wealth is the significance of God's blessing. That on its own is true, but when, when the emphasis is on the wealth and not the God who brings the wealth, then that becomes a, a problem. So that is uh, one of the issues that we, we, we need to be looking at tonight. So, so when we look at it properly, what was happening do, in those days? You have what we call the serfs, which is you know the, like the poor people who are sort of, if you want to call them slaves, that's fine. So they are working for these rich people. And when you look at them, the, the proportion of the rich is actually quite small, but they are controlling the vast, you know, the, the vast economy. And these serfs are, are, are working for them. And so in those middle ages, in fact, this system is called feudalism. So if you look at feudalism, what the system means, it means that, you know, the rich are oppressing the poor. Sometimes, you know, they give them a land whereby they pay money back, but they are actually enslaved. They, they don't have freedom. They stay there and work for their master for peanuts, really. And they, you know, they get this sort of um, oppression, really. So that is what, what is happening in those, um, in those uh, the days. So these people ran the farms and fields for the owners and did all the work. And after all their work, they were cheated by not getting paid. So the rationale of the owners is that this is okay. It's okay to do that. Uh, so, so they were just really caving in to the worldly pressure of financial success every, every, over every other thing else. So James is condemning the op uh, oppression of the poor, um, for which, as we have seen from what we read, there will be punishment from God if, if the, the rich continues to oppress the poor. Um, so that is really also the, the lesson for us to, to learn. So when we look at particularly verse one to three in particular, uh, we could deduce that what we chase is temporarily and we rot if, if we try to put our trust in the wealth of this world, okay? So even those things we think are important are usually not. People who place their trust in wealth, accomplishments, education, themselves and whatever other way they place themselves without putting it in God, they are heading for trouble. Okay, as, as these things they are trusting in, what, what does it do? It just takes them away from God. Uh, and, and also once, once you're not following God, you're following the devil. So what does the, both, the, both of these things do? They separate us from God. And that is not where we want to be. We want to be heading for eternity. Not those things separating us and uh, we're ending up you know, on this planet Earth, not achieving anything. Um, so this is a, this is a warning here uh, that um, you know we don't need to allow these things to distract us. We need to be focused on God, and we need to be focused on eternity, so that we will you know sort of end well, really, and not uh, ending badly. So if we go specifically back to where we read, there are some um, words that are, we need to now explain what they, they mean. So it's, it's, from that verse one, it say, come now. So come now is just an exaltation, is a well, you know, to, to, to weep 
really was just like a graphic way to present your case. So it shows the veracity of the situation, come now. Okay, you can see the urgency in that. And then obviously, uh, you say, come now, you reach. Okay, reach. I don't think we need to any explanation really about what reach is at this level. And when uh, James was writing, he was really referring to the social class of the aristocrats, uh, the people who are wealthy in those days. Um, but what we also need to set uh, straight away is that wealth in, in itself is actually not condemned here. It's just the way we see the wealth that is a problem. Yeah, of course, as God's children, we should be wealthy and we are wealthy. So, but what we're trying to say is that that wealth, that material possession shouldn't really distract us from the focus to focus on God, okay? So wealth can be a blessing from God if we use it as a tool and not as a devotion. I think we should really underline that as a very important saying, okay? So the condemnation James gives here applies to the abuse of money to oppress the poor. That is what is not right, okay? We shouldn't really treat the poor badly because God has commanded us not to do that. So actually, you know, it is the manner of the heart. This is a manner of the heart as our checkbook will show where our loyalty is and our commitment and also our interests abound. So please, that is the, 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 the issue. We should not abuse money to use it to oppress the poor. That is not good. Again, that place talked about garments. In those days, actually, clothes were more expensive possessions, even sometimes greater than even a home. So clothes were a primary symbol of for people to show off how rich they are. Uh, so those, these serfs, who, who are basically the servants, most of them you know, will not probably have one piece of garment to wear, whereas the rich had fine linen, cotton, and silk, and in most cases, a lot of them to wear. So they, they had a lot, whereas the poor didn't have anything. Um, and they was also talking about their, uh, say your garments are rotten, rot eaten. So corrupt, rust. So these are terms really to describe decay, okay? So something that is not very nice. Uh, so I'm talking about decay. And uh, so in the end, it is worthless and meaningless if, if they could be doing all these things without uh, knowing what God wants from them. So the devotion to wealth comes from selfish motivations. And this chef selfishness would be used to judge us. So we need to bear that in mind uh, and not to devote so much to wealth to, in, in, in that extent to take our attention from God. That's what the, the, he's talking about there. So in essence, we can look at it to say, to say that the Christians and the Jewish uh, aristocrats who were oppressing the poor were heinously killed by the Romans after the revolt. So again, the judgment came to them personally and totally. So to seek wealth over God and his call is to rob oneself of his precious opportunities and the substance of himself, which is God and of a greater treasure in exchange for something that is very minuscule. Okay, so you really need to underline that, yeah, we shouldn't seek wealth over God and his call. And doing that is really robbing ourselves of the precious opportunity and the substance of God himself. Um, so the other thing that we need to talk about there in terms of our where we are reading uh, also made a mention of um, the issue of um, worry. Yeah. Um, do you worry? So consider that we have a God who loves. Self. Now, human beings, we, are, we, are, we will be prone to worries. There's no doubt about that. The, the problem is how do you carry the worry? When you are getting worried about something, do you take it as a personal worry that you can sort out or do you actually 
remember God in the worry. So the, 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 the idea is for, for us to consider that we have a God who loves and who provides, okay? So he fulfills us with himself beyond our expectation. So he will meet our deepest needs. This is reassuring now. If, you, if we remember this and pray in that line, we'll see that the worry will be less, or even, even, even more better disappear. So we can trust in him. So the, 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 the advice is if you are a warrior, the call is to worship in the place of that worry. Okay? Yeah. Worship instead of worrying, go on worship, go in prayers. You will find more fulfillment in them. The poor, the poor. So, so the poor, there is a poor that time during that century, there's still the poor today, the poor has not disappeared in, in our midst. Uh, so there is still the poor. So the poor will not be ignored by God. Their cries reaches God. So you need to be aware of that as well. So our responsibility to care for them must be heeded. We need to care for the poor. So there's never an excuse to cheat or take an advantage of another person. There's no justification whatsoever what you can explain to God, that was the reason why you cheated on somebody or you took advantage of that person. Those are not God, godly acts. They can only be evil. So for a Christian, you know, these, these acts are in opposition to whom Christ is and what he has done for us, okay? The cry and the fact of the evidence are testimony and the evidence against such an evil person. So yes, when, when you are oppressing that poor person and they are crying out to God, don't think that God is not going to hear their cry. So please let us take heed and not maltreat or, or, or cheat or take advantage of the poor. And again, in those days, what were the, the, the other way the rich oppressed the poor is that they, they were not paying them their wages, okay? They would do all this hard work only for them not to get paid. And you can see the, the impact that would have had with them and their families. They will not be able to provide anything with, to their family. Their family will be starving. So to not pay someone was considered evil and violated the law of God. Even if you put it into today's standard, where people have mortgages to pay and children to feed and things like that, how can somebody work for you and you wouldn't pay them? That is really a big you know, oppression you know, so it is um, something that is not allowed then. That's so that what is was bad then, and it's still bad today. Even in today's uh, day and age, it's a it's a very serious uh, issue. And then again, again in the line of not paying them, it defrauding them. Okay, so these poor people, their earnings are small anyway, and you know, it's just a fraction compared to what the owners of the their, their loss they are working for, how much they have. So, uh, so when the workers were paid, it was not sufficient to even to provide care for themselves and their family. So sometimes they weren't even able to clean the land that that they, they that they just worked worked on. So that will tell you the you know so cheating these people in this way is just regarded as a fraud. Again, um, in one of those verses there, the there was mention of the Lord of um, Sabbath, the, the Lord Almighty. These are just the name of God, referred to Jehovah Sabbath, and it means the Lord of hosts, the commander of the angelic hosts, and the armies of God. So the Jewish reasoning here is that it is a, a bad idea to offend the public official, much less the God of the universe, okay? So the point is that our, you know, misled, misdeeds rather, greatly offended our God, who is also all powerful and all caring, okay? Yeah, if, in fact, if it's even recorded that uh, the dispatches is, is, is we can take uh, some lessons here that it was even 
uh, through this, uh, this is a passage that so it says and infuriated the rich high priest that they made uh, James uh, matter. So you can see how sensitive these sort of things are. But that is um, that is the the reality of the of the occasion. Um, let me see. Yeah. Okay. So we move on. Now again, the word fattened their hearts was used. Again, it's a way that the, the rich uh, you know, looked after themselves you know, in the sort of comparison to the poor. So the image, when you look at fatten your heart, it's, it's an image of animal being slaughtered. So the rich are those animals who are not aware or who do not care and uh, you know they are just fattening themselves before slaughter so it's not a very good image it's just showing that the the the, the destruction that is coming on their way but which they are not aware of um so the message is that those are those desires we have that are contrary to god's call and precepts will lead us to destruction that's that's what it's all is all about so it is not necessarily because God is there waiting with an ass, rather he is there with his loving arms open. So when we ignore him, we destroy ourselves. He has warned us that it will happen. So sort of a God who does not warn is a God who does not love, but that is not our God. God our, our God always warns. It's, it's we who do not listen. Now, there's also a reference made to the day of slaughter. Just again, just a reference to say, you know, just one of these days that occurred during the sheep shearing season or, or harvest, you know, that the time they just removed the, the coating of the, of the ships. So for the rich, it was seen that, you know, it, it was a time for them to feast, eat a lot of meat, and they again did not particular attention to the poor who in most cases didn't really have anything so um, again portraying how the poor has been mal maltreated so uh, so again it's another attention for us to see how the rich maltreated uh, the poor Again, when we look at their issues of condemned, murdered, was also raised. So in that context, again, it is not that it's not actually talking about mother, but the setting up of events that leads to it. So the abuse of power will cause the loss of life. We know it, even in this our own current situation. Yeah, there's a lot of ways which you can maltreat people and you virtually, they are alive, but they are like dead. So the rich were taking food away from the people, not providing wages so that they starve while they worked and their goods were taken away in extortion so that they will freeze to death. So all these are ways whereby you can kill somebody indirectly. So the image is the oppression of the poor really. Uh, as the wicked, we are scheming against the righteous. So in, in this context, James, we're just wanting them to repent. Um, the condemnation of judgment does not pertain to a Christian because we are saved by grace. It is the condemnation to the non-Christian. So when we look at these things, should the real Christian actually be doing all these things? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And if somebody who thought they are real Christian shouldn't be doing things like this. Um, they shouldn't be doing things like this. Oh, any person who thinks they are Christian and doing things like this should really question their faith again to see whether they are really proper uh, Christians. So in essence, what is James trying to tell us? James is not saying wealth is wrong. Rather, he denounces wealth when it gets in the way of our relationship and call from God. And when we use it to bring harm to others, that is what is condemning. So 
This comes down to our attitude concerning security and priorities about money over spiritual and relational matters. Okay, so it's, it's all about priority. When we start to prioritize wealth above the spiritual matters, then you know we're in, we're in a lot of trouble. We're not a lot of trouble. We are missing the mark there. So our focus needs to be on God and our trust in him, not money, things, or power. Yes. God gives all those things. God gives money. God gives things. God gives power. So why should we not trust God so that we can have those things in abundance? So it is not your bank account. It is your soul account that matters. Where is your soul? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, is your soul in your bank or is your soul targeting eternity? So our true riches are in Christ alone. Wealth is not sinful or even harmful as long as it is seen as a tool and not, and not your master. Use it as a tool. Okay? So it does not become a problem and a distraction when it becomes our focus. And... So it does, it does become a problem and a distraction when it becomes our focus and God is pushed out of the picture. That's, what, that's the time trouble starts. So I highlighted this. Please take note of what I'm just going to say now. We are called to use and be responsible and accountable stewards with wealth. So. The advice is use it wisely with honesty and do not hoard it, misuse it, exploit it, steal it, or waste it. Give it away generously towards the poor and towards building up the kingdom of God. That is what we need to be doing with wealth. I think if we do it like that, God will be happy with us. So remember, when we draw near to the world, God is pushed away. The warning is twofold. So one, we are not to oppress the poor and needy. That is never a, a, a reason why a call to do that. Rather, we are to help and provide, educate and motivate. Secondly, by seeking wealth, we are the oppressors to ourselves. We are seeking what God, what only God is to fulfill. Okay, take that reference from Matthew 6, 33. So the question is, do we listen up to what God is saying to us? Do we ask ourselves, and of course, God himself, what does God want from us? What does God want from me? Because if we do not, our focus in life becomes skewed. To focus upon what the world defines as success is to miss out on the things that are much greater, both for here and now, and for eternity that is to come. So the latter part, we need to look at patient in suffering. So the general idea here is that this passage is about standing firm, um, which we can do all from sowing the rice seed to receiving the greatest harvest of the highest quality. It takes patience to walk the land. Just, we are just giving a comparison here to the farmer the farmer who walks the land. It takes patience. One must first of all clear the field, plot the dirt, plant the seed, thin the sprouts, clear the weeds, fertilize, irrigate, you know, constantly taking care of the plants, trim, pollinate, engage it. You know, so, so this is hard work. This is hard work. It's also time consuming, okay? It takes time and effort. So it does not just happen overnight at a win. So I will, also explain to you how our Christian life is compared to the life of a farmer. You can see what the farmer does is a lot. That is actually, there's a mirror image that comes with our own life as Christians. So it is, it is the same with our spiritual formation. We receive Christ into our lives, but that is not the end of the matter. Rather, it is actually the beginning, the time you, 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 you you say, you know, give your life to Christ. So what happens? 
Jesus plants the seed, the Holy Spirit waters it, and then we embark on our great adventure, the journey of Christianity. The cultivation of our own lives by the holy, by the spiritual dis disciplines of the Bible. Okay, so mm -hmm. once you do that, you then come into the, dis the, the dis disciplines of the Bible, discipline yourself how you should read the Bible, how you should pray, learn, share, devotions, fasting, fellowship, which we are doing today, and so on. So, so then we are honed and trimmed so that we can grow. You see how the whole things we are doing to grow. So it, again, you know, good comparison with the farmer. Okay, so it doesn't come, it doesn't come like that. It doesn't come easily. So this is a show, a slow and glorious process. It's not a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Okay, uh, this is what the Christian life is all about on this earth, and it's about a journey, and not the destination. You need to underline that, yes, although we've got a journey and a destination, it is the journey that matters. The des the des our destination is already booked and secured. Now, we are to concentrate on what we need to do to reach that our destination. And that is what me and you are struggling with every day. Yeah, our destination, Christ has mapped it out, it's in eternity. We know where we are going. But it's not, it's not about that. It's about the journey, how to, how to get there. Okay, so even when others come against us to exploit and betray us, our purpose is to grow in our security in Christ. We need to remember this always, it will help us. It will help us. So the call in verse seven to eight, the call there is for patient, patience. What we need to remember as Christians is that we will go through difficulties, but we need to exercise patience. God is still in control. Even when we do not see it, he will return. And even if it does not happen in our lifetime, he is still on the throne and he has our very being in his hand and his heart. He knows about us. He thinks about us. When our eyes are on Christ, then our eyes are not overwhelmed by what we are going through in life. It's only when we take away our eyes from Christ that we are overwhelmed. As the farmer looks to the rain, we are also to look at the ultimate farmer, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our hope because he is our courage. To be patient. To be patient means to wait, means waiting. So the context here infers waiting for a correction of justice. Yeah? Yeah. We do not automatically receive God's promise except for our salvation. We have to wait for his timing. God's timing is the best. God's timing is the best. Luke 18, 1 to 8, will give you some more information about this timing of, of God. So the one is that those who transgress, who sin, will be judged. So we can wait because we have hope. In the greater purpose which is unfolding for us. So that is the joy of being a Christian. We can wait for that. Now, there's a reference made where we read about the coming of our Lord. We've, we've studied this in other texts in the past. So often called the last days, it can also mean the Messianic era. So it does not necessarily mean that time is running out. Okay? It is not a time. When we talk about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is not a time reference, but a period in time. So we need to understand this very well. Okay? Um, the point is that God's unfolding revelation for us is in his grace. We need to know every day the grace of God that God shows us is his unfolding revelation. You cannot get a better way to know to know God. Yeah? So in that unfolding grace, he is giving us his fullness and the finality that is to come. Because if we, if we don't start experiencing it now, you, you will not know what it's all about. So all views look to Christ's second coming as the next great event in our redemptive history. That's what all of us are waiting for. 
Okay, nowhere in the Bible are we given a timeline of when it will take place, we, but we know that it will. So we are called always to be watching for it, but not to be obsessed by this, by this. Because once we get to obsess, it takes us away from the main calling of building up the kingdom of God and discipleship, okay? Some people sometimes get carried away and every day they're, they're just uh, doing that preparation in a way that has taken them away from building up the kingdom, going to you know, uh, win souls for Christ, discipling new, new believers. So we still need to do those things. Yeah, we don't need to be obsessed by it. So these things happened, even James who was writing here, it happened in his era. So that is still valid in our own time now. Yeah, farmer, the place we have read, we made mention of farmer uh, and his work of cultivation and harvest. These are all images of growth and judgment, okay? If the farmer does very well, he will have growth. If he didn't do very well, he will have a poor harvest, which is equivalent of the judgment that will pass. So this parallels the parable of, the, of Jesus in Matthew 13. A farmer was totally dependent back then on the rain, soil, and so for his crop. So in like manner, we are totally dependent on God for our salvation and assistance in our spiritual growth, okay? However, both we and the farmer, we have something in common. Both the Christian, Christian and the farmer has something in common. Both have to still toil in the evidence to make it come about. We have to toil in our quest to be good Christians and to, and to have eternity. The farmer has to toil in order to make a good harvest. The toiling has to continue. You can't have it easy. You can't have it easy. Yeah, reference was made to precious and valuable, which means very important things and good things that are valuable as, as is a fruit uh, of, of the earth to give us sustained life. So, um, so the image here, again, refers to harvest and referencing judgment. So it is good for the elect, but bad for those who reject Christ. So, so that, that, that's, that's the way that one goes. So, as we have just been talking, and this illustration from agriculture is so appropriate for us and our faith development because the example parallels the cultivation of the harvest as the culture of our faith. The, the effort, the requirement, the obedience that is required, as well as the trust in the farmer, our Lord Jesus Christ. All these uh, those things are paramount if we are to succeed as, uh, as Christians. Um, so without any effort, we will yield no results, no harvest at all. Yet, when we are being cared for and cultivated in God, we will yield bounties of abundance, even contagious faith. That faith, the faith that is contagious is a faith that will lead other people to Christ when they see it in us. So, you see, when we are really bountiful of bubbling in the Lord, that, that faith will come out and we'll use it to, 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 to do exploits for the kingdom of God. So, Let's just read to verse 9 and then maybe we'll stop there. Do not grumble, as in do not be complaining. Okay? Sometimes we Christians will grumble a lot. We grumble just about anything. If they tell us to pray, we grumble. If they tell you to read the Bible, you grumble. If they tell you to come to church, you grumble. So don't criticize or find fault or be irritable or be argumentative with fellow believers. And definitely not to unbelievers, because we can tolerate you if you do that. But if you go to unbelievers, you've lost the, the fight. So, so all that does when you have those qualities, grumble, is that it brings stress and misery, really. Yet, when we look to him, our Lord Jesus Christ, our trust becomes complete. Okay? So our hope is fulfilled, and ultimately there is nothing about which to complain. So it's better to look at our Lord Jesus Christ so that all this grumbling and complaining will be sorted out. Yet, 
James here still makes the case that we can and are called also to speak against what is wrong. What is wrong is wrong. You cannot be seeing people now, or see somebody committing sin and you, you keep quiet over it. You, you, that is not good, okay? What is wrong is wrong, such as oppression. Oppre somebody oppressing another person is wrong and you have to speak out on that, on that issue. So um, what is not right is, as we studied in James, you know, this uh, was what just saying here is our hostile oration, what, what comes out of our mouth. If it is toxic, it does, you know, infuriate people. And the, the judge mentioned in that verse nine also means, in, you know, the judgment of the last days, really. So that, that's what is referencing. So, um, so that, that is what is referencing there for us to be aware of. And that verse nine mentioned about standing on the door. Christ's return is imminent. Not necessarily in timing, as I said before, but in his actual presence amongst us. So whatever we face, it is only for a season and then it will be over, okay? Our hope is in our relationship in him and in his return to come, not in what is going on around us. That is where we, our hope should be. So what is going around you now might be so bad and not very pleasant, but not, that is not where your hope should be. I hope should be in your relationship with, with Christ and his return. So we are called to speak out against injustice. Yes, injustice always you speak out. You may wish to vent your discontent, but make sure you do not blow it out of proportion. Yeah, blowing it out of proportion is very bad, as well as also bottling it up and not saying anything. So, but complaining, is also not good. Complaining serves only to steer the discord or strife, increase stress, irritate others, and place the focus where it is not supposed to be. So, but there are times whereby we are encouraged to get things off our chest, um, but it must be actually, if you want to say you get it out, you must have to get it out. And uh, because if you don't get it out, then it keeps poking you and uh, stressing you out. And if care is not taken, it might consume you. And by consuming you, it's drawing you away from Christ. So that is the danger of, of not dealing with these things appropriately. So we are advised to deal with them appropriately. So I will uh, stop in that verse nine. Next week, we'll start from verse 10. And um, I will, um, at this stage, give a say back anybody who wants to add or add anything to the study or any suggestions, you are free to do so, but we can end on time and then look at the second part next week. And so that we we'll also have time to pray. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Minister Duro for, for that section. Yeah, what I just want to add to what she had, what he has said to us is with regards to money. Money is a very stronghold that devil has used to reach to believers. You see some people, they are very strong. They don't do any other, they don't fall into any other sin easily. But as soon as it becomes money, it's a stronghold to them that this lesson today is a reminder to every one of us to know that, that money is good, but the Bible said the love of it is the root of all evil. And when he was talking about, you know, when somebody works for you and you don't pay them. Truly, some people do it and they, they still do it today. In this very country, I know about a, a Christian, not just a Christian, he's an elder. This, this Mr. and Mrs. An elder in the church, they have a company, they have a, an agency. But we notice that 
from time to time, people are complaining, people working with them are complaining, they don't pay them. Mm. This is not just hearsay, it's, it, I've received like one, two, three complaints. When I had the first one, I was saying, oh, they might be lying. But when the second person came, the third person came, so it's no longer a lie. No. So the thing was so bad that it affected some of these people from going to church. They would say, oh, these churches, I worked for this man and this woman. They, do, they didn't pay me. Actually, one of the sisters went back to Nigeria finally without them paying them, paying, paying her her money. So at times I wonder, so why do they do that? You know, so it happens that the only answer, I don't know, I didn't ask them because it's, it's not directly connected to me. But these people came to complain to me because I know this family too. I find out that it's just greed. Greed. The wanting to get it or somebody works for you, your, your client or contractor has paid you, pay your laborers. But the greed to have everything. So it is a call for every one of us believers that is a strong point, is a stronghold of the devil. You could be strong in every other things, but that area could be a weak link. So let this word we had tonight throw a light to all of us Christians in that direction. Mm. That money, money is good, it solves problems, but when you begin to love it, when you begin to love it, it can make you do things that are unbelievable. So let us understand that. Let us be aware of it. Don't say, oh, no, it won't happen. Maybe now you're not an employer yet. Tomorrow you're going to be an employer. You have laborers that are under you. Yes. How would you treat them? If you remember this message, even when the temptation to come out, to, when the temptation comes to not to pay them, you will remember the message today that it's not godly to do so. Yes. And God will help every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Thank you, Pastor.